pretty from where you're from where I'm at. They're gonna either they're gonna be close enough that it's gonna be, you know what I mean because of the way it's the way it's set up that you wouldn't want to shoot down because of the too far down that valley because of everything in the way. But it does give you, there's a pretty clear you can see pretty clearly. It's pretty neat actually, but it's a nice place. But, uh, anyway, so that'll be Saturday. So I don't know what you guys are doing on Saturday. Um, Brother Russ did uh, message me and say if you guys are going to go up that way or something like preaching, he'd like to meet. So if you're going to preach on Saturday, you know, I'll try to, I, hopefully I get one in the morning and I can just, you know, it'll take me half the day. I'll make Brother Anthony get out of bed and pull it, help me pull it up the hill. Like, you better get up, man. <laughs> you better get up. You are going to help me pull that up the hill. I'm going to be like, you get up and help me pull that up the hill, man. <laughs> yeah, he won't even answer the door. He'll be like, I ain't answering that door. You nuts. It's freezing out there, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> anyway, but uh, so uh, interesting, though, this week, I – the, the the psychotic Landon fans, they keep sending me emails. It's not actually the same lady. The one that just sent this one is a different one. Um, she called me a big shot. Hey, you big shot, you. Why don't you? If you're so... <laughs> if, you're so if you're so tough, why don't you message me on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I can't figure my email out. I'm like, okay, okay, well. <laughs> so message me on Facebook. Uh, no, I don't think I need you to chew me out again. You already sent me a three-page email. So now I just don't even care. I just post them right on Facebook. Here, everybody, look, here's another one. Because I got nothing to hide, so I'm just gonna I'm just going to throw it all out there like that. If that's the kind of thing it is. Now, obviously, if somebody sends me a private email or something – you know, like that, I wouldn't post it there. But, but for something like this, you know, just totally psychotic, crazy people that just, I mean. And then there's some guy named God Slayer. I think he either seen us preaching or he plays music in this town. I think it's the same guy. But anyway, or like around, I don't know. Anyway, he's from Minnesota, I guess. And this guy named God Slayer, he keeps like, he'll listen to the sermons and then he'll send me, I think he's listening to them. He said, you're a real, he goes, you guys crack me up, you and Brandon Teague, and he's making fun of us, you know, he's like, you know, he just gets on there, he gets real mad, mad and angry about everything, and, and, uh, anyway, so, I don't know, but, uh, so people get upset. Now, that C.S. Lewis sermon, just so you know, uh, that has seven, almost 750 downloads on Sermon Audio. That is actually, it's in the top seven sermons. Boy, you know, and I haven't had that much hate mail either, which surprises me. Unless for some reason it's like being held back for something. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, maybe the flood of it's going to come in later or something. But I haven't had a whole lot of I, I haven't had a whole lot of comments on it really. All I've had is just people listening to it. So maybe they're just like shocked and they're like, "I didn't know that." Well, like I said earlier, if if you didn't know that, then hang on because tonight's going to be even worse than it was. Uh, there, because we're going to get into actually uh, some of the things of uh, of of his writings. The wit, it, basically, I I really think that C.S. Lewis was a witch. I, I personally do believe that he was. Um, and uh, it, it's as I've studied it and studied him and the things that he was putting into his writings. It's bad. I mean, I mean, it, the stuff that we're, we're going to, we'll just get started. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I got I to gotta make sure I have enough time so, I, so we get out of here all right. And, and uh, Brother Andrew's got to work, work in the morning. And, right? We got to get, we got to, we got to get moving. Brother Ryan, he's, a, he's like a banker. He don't go in till noon or something, so he's fine. <laughs> you know, he doesn't don't go in till noon. He's, he's all right. He's not too worried about it. Is it 3.30? Well, I'll make sure I preach all the way up until the time you have to leave then. Give you something to think about while you're in that truck. Amen. All right. This, this is the second 
message in that series on C.S. Lewis. Listen to me. There's, there's people that are so deceived by this man. Uh, listen, these books are in Christian schools. They're, they're in Christian schools. They're in Christians' homes. I'm talking about independent Baptist homes. And, and listen, I, I, I'm not trying to pick on anybody that's had these books or read these books or anything like that. I'm going to expose what's in them so you can be careful and then you can say, you know what, I was wrong about that. Lord, forgive me. I'm not going to have those anymore. I'm not going to be a part of any of that anymore. And then you can help other people that try to say, but listen, tonight we're going to cover C.S. Lewis, The Real Witch of Narnia. So this is called C.S. Lewis, the real witch of Narnia. I believe he, I, I believe this man is, was a witch. I really, honestly do. Uh, whether whether uh, he was he w- whether he got himself into a circle and a pentagram or not, this man was a witch. He practiced like one. Uh, he had this universal religion and mentality. We're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. I'm going to finish up with this on Sunday. And this man, his influence, uh, there's things that people don't know about this man. For instance, I'll, this is saved for Sunday, but I'll just give you a little hint here. This man confessed his, yeah, commercial. This man confessed his sins to a priest. He had a priest that he confessed his sins to. Now, that is, I mean, so th- is this man part, was this man part of Mystery Babylon the Great? Absolutely. I mean, without a doubt, he was. And you're going to see in his writings, I'm going to talk to you. Hey, and listen, don't get mad at me. All right, don't get mad or don't say, well, why are you talking about this witchcraft and all this? Hey, listen, some of you read the books, all right? So don't get mad at me. I'm just going to expose what's in there so you understand exactly what is in there. And then, and then I, I really think you ought to have a duh moment because I really can't figure out how God's people could have been that deceived by this. Now, I understand that there's a bewitching power with the devil. I understand, but and we don't like to admit that we've been deceived, but I am just trying to figure out by some of these things that I, that I just looked in the books themselves, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Christians read this and didn't go like, whoa, what am I reading here? No, they didn't. And, and, and that part still, it, it I, it kind of dumbfounds me a little bit. I'm just like, I don't get it. I don't get how you didn't notice this. This is like blatant. And how churches that have Christian schools let these books in. And it's like, really? I mean, really? Like, like, I, I don't, I mean, listen, I, I had Hollywood movies and I had other, I, I, I understand all that, but man, this is a different level. And it's very plain. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to insult anybody. But I guess I just want to make it very plain and, and very easy. And let's go through these things and let's see. Um, let's just see uh, what, what it says. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Look what Paul said, though. He said, and no marvel. Oh, don't marvel, he says. Oh, don't marvel. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And then I I thought of this verse as I was doing my Bible study the other day. Acts chapter 8, verse number 11. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. I thought that was fitting. I thought it just fit perfectly right in there. Because that's really what it is. I, you know, really I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that, his bewitching influence. I'm going to cover that on Sunday. But it's amazing. Now I'm going to get into reading some of his works. And, uh, and some of the others, we'll, we'll be, we'll be uh, putting in a lot of Bible in here too, back and forth. But, but just... I want you to read what some folks said about him, just some of his works, some of the things he said in the Chronicles of Narnia and in his writings. We already covered on Sunday the things that, I mean, just his theology. His theology is enough to run from him. What he believed about the Bible and didn't believe about the Bible is enough to run, never to listen to him again. But just the blatant witchcraft and wickedness of this man. I don't think people understand the influence of this man. 
the absolute in he is one of the number one evangelical apologetic so to speak writers that have been followed today i mean unbelievable and he is a snake he was a snake and a devil all right lewis was anything but a classical evangelical socially or theologically wrote bob uh, Smeaton in, in uh, Christianity Today article titled C.S. Lewis Superstar. He continued with these thought pro provoking statements, though he shared basic Christian beliefs with evangelicals. <laughs> he didn't subscribe to biblical inerrancy or penal substitution. He believed in purgatory and baptismal regeneration. It's a good book for Baptists to have. How did someone with such a checkered pedigree come to be a theological Elvis Presley adored by evangelicals? Well, he ain't lying. Part of Lewis's cur current appeal is a postmodern interest in thin places, places where the physical world and the spiritual world meet. Listen closely. And for myth that makes sense of life in a way that rational thinking can't. For their, does, for their, for their dose of myth, postmoderns turn to the matrix. Now, I don't have even any time to go down that road. But I'm going to tell you, I've never watched the Matrix trilogy or anything. I've never seen it. I don't, I'm not going to watch it. But I will say, from everything that I've heard, it is absolutely 100% Masonic and esoteric to the core. But so was C.S. Lewis. And so are the Chronicles of Narnia. They say that He says they turn to the Matrix, the Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Harry Potter, and of course, Narnia. Well, of course. See, Narnia, the Chronicles of Narnia is C.S. Lewis and his buddy Tolkien, which, by the way, I'm going to get, too. That's coming. I'm going to deal with him, too. Because that, that devil seduced a lot of people, too. And they're a bunch of esoteric occultists is all they were. I mean, they were mad. See, folks, what you don't understand is they're more dangerous than Harry Potter. That's what you don't get. Because most Baptists will out and out, most fundamentals will out, will out and out reject Harry Potter. But they will embrace the same principles in the Chronicles of Narnia. It's all about the packaging. Listen. You gotta learn. The Bible says over and over again, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. Over and over again. That means you're to be on your guard. You're to be watching. But I fear that most people have been deceived. So, he goes on to say this, fantasy allows you to explain and grasp and, and intricate into your life things that, and integrate into your life things that are not logical. It is to say that we can tell each other truth in story. <laughs> in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis tells how it ate. Now, now listen closely because this is too much. I mean, you couldn't even, I don't even know how you could plan this. These numbers and everything are just... They're, they're just downright spooky is what they are. But anyway, listen to this, okay? In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis tells how at age 13 he abandoned his Anglican faith due to the influence of a schoolmistress who was involved with theosophy, Rosicurianism, spiritualism, the whole Anglo-American occultist tradition. <laughs> what does that mean? And Lewis developed a lust for the occult that remained with him even after he returned to Anglicanism. He said this. Now listen to this very closely. Because he is telling you exactly what he believes. Ready? <clears throat> he said, and that started in me something with which on and off I have had plenty of trouble since the desire for the pre-natural, simply as such, the passion for the occult. This is Lewis talking. Not everyone has this disease. Those who have will know what I mean. 
I once tried to describe it in a novel. It is a spiritual lust. And like the lust of the body, it has the fatal power of making everything else in the world seem uninteresting while it lasts. End quote. What did he say? He just told you that he had a lust for the occult that never left him. Well, that's a little obvious. It's in all of his writings. That's, that's a tad bit on the obvious side, isn't it? It ought to be. When you see everything that he wrote, it was absolutely esoteric. It was absolutely occultic. Mm. Lewis said that he described that lust for the occult in a novel. It occurs in the third book of his science fiction trilogy. He calls it science fiction. But let me tell you one thing. It's witchcraft. You just mark that down, okay? Make all your friends mad, quote Pastor Cooley, and tell them that he calls science fiction witchcraft. Because that's all it is. It's witchcraft. If the power doesn't come from the Lord Jesus Christ, where does it come from? Here's the problem, folks, in all of this. And I'm going to get to this when, he, when everybody tries to say, well, it's an allegory of the... Well, we're we're going we're gonna to use his own words when he says it's an allegory, and it's not an allegory of the Christian life. Okay, he was a bold-faced liar is what he was. It is not any allegory of any Christian life. If that's your Christian life, you are a lost, hell-bound sinner that's going to do a nosedive into hell. Amen. It ain't got nothing to do with Christ. What it has to do with is the occult. Science fiction is just witchcraft repackaged. That's all it is. There's nothing holy, there's nothing righteous, there's nothing right about it. There's nothing biblical about it. It is full of nothing but magic and power. And where does that power come from? Does it come from God? Here's the dangerous because, see, it traps little kids. And they started at a young age watching that. And, I, and I, I watched it, and I loved it. Man, I loved it. I loved every movie like that. <clears throat> Lewis said that he described that lust for the occult. He said in a novel, a man is in the process of being initiated into an inner ring. Listen to this in this book. A man is in the process of being initiated into an inner ring of scientists who are occultists. They worship demons, which they call macrobes, huge, powerful, invisible things, as opposed to macrobes, which are tiny, invisible things. Here he surely at last, so his desire whispered to him, was the true inner circle of all. <laughs> okay, what do we know about circles? Okay, what is he talking about when he says a true inner circle? What does he mean by a circle? What is he talking about? Well, what, what, remember the circle maker? Remember that? That's just good, clean fun, right? No. Here, 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 surely at last, so his desire whispered to him, was the true inner circle of all, the circle whose center was outside the human race. <laughs> okay, what do they try to conjure up in circles? The ultimate secret, the supreme power, the last initiation. The fact that it was almost completely horrible did not in the least diminish its attraction. Wow. These creatures, these creatures breathed death on the human race and on all joy. Not despite this, but because of this, the terrible gravitation sucked and tugged and fascinated him towards them. Never before had he known the fruitful strength of the movement opposite to nature, which now had him in its grip, the impulse to reverse all reluctancies and, the draw, and to draw every circle anti-clockwise. Remember what, remember what Aleister Crowley said about things backwards? Okay. By the way, that book, The Hideous Strength, Wicked. In fact, I believe, now I could be wrong, but I believe that that is a book that, that Orwell quoted from and that he looked at. I could be wrong, though, but I thought that's what I heard the other day when I was doing some studying, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into that deeper to make sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what he said. All right, now, 
I want to give you a testimony from a former witch that is now a pastor. Okay, he got saved. The Lord saved his soul, changed his life, and he got delivered from that. Amen? Praise God, that happens. God, God is able to deliver. Amen? He's able to deliver. Um, this former witch, Pastor David Meyer, writes the following concerning Narnia. As a former witch, an astrologer, and an occultist who have been saved by the grace of God, I know that the works of C.S. Lewis are required reading by neophyte witches, especially in the United States and England. This includes the Chronicles of Narnia because it teaches neophyte or new witches the basic mindset of the craft. Isn't it strange, though, that many Christian churches and organizations have used the Chronicles of Narnia as Sunday school curriculum? When I saw the release date of this new movie, he's talking about the Chronicles of Narnia back when it first came out, the newest one in, the two, in like 2005 or 8 or something. I was not surprised, he said. December 9th is the 13th day before the witches' quarter Sabbat of Yule. The full cold moon is mid, midway between the release date and the Sabbat of Yule. The waxing moon is also directly on the equinox on the release date of the movie. You understand they're observers of times? What are they doing? Well, they're using the power of all the satanic forces when the veil is there, when they have their high days. They're using all that wicked demonic power and they're releasing the movies on those dates and doing as much wickedness and damage and spiritual cursing as they possibly can do during that time. And Christians just flocked out to the movies and to go watch them. The waxing moon is also directly on the equinox on the release date of the movie. This is far too precisely occultic to be coincidental. And the producers of the movie no doubt consulted upper-level witches regarding the perfect day to have Chronicles of Narnia open. Well, with Disney being with Disney being the producer, they didn't have to go too far to find some high-level witches now, did they? With Disney being the one that produced it, they really didn't have to ask a whole lot of questions, did they? They knew exactly what they were doing, didn't they? Because Walt Disney and the Disney Corporation is completely satanic, Luciferian, wicked esoteric I don't even have time to get into that but I anyway um, <clears throat> I've already covered a lot of that the story of the Narnian Chronicle this is still that pastor known as the lion the witch and the wardrobe is one of the clandestine occult mysticism and is not Sunday school material unless your Sunday school is a de facto witch's coven well come on the story involves a child from the normal, everyday, or mundane world. This girl, Lucy, who hides in a wardrobe as she is playing a game, suddenly finds herself transported to another world very unlike her own. It is a world of intelligent, talking animals and strange creature. The little girl soon finds herself with a tea, having tea with a fawn. Now, we're going to get to that in a minute, but that is just some... That, oh, boy. This is really wicked and sick. But it, may, it makes sense that Disney produced this movie, though. Absolutely makes, makes a lot of sense that Disney produces. Um, and by the way, your children need to understand this so they know to hate the evil and to cling to that which is good. We don't, we're not going to get into incantations or anything stupid like that because I don't know any of them, amen? <laughs> I don't need to know any of them. The point of this is not just so you could see. Here's what the problem is. We have kept everything so closed off so nobody sees anything. And our children, it, it fascinates them. They want to know, well, what's going on with that? Why do they watch all those movies? So what you do is you just, you just reveal it and tell them the truth about it, what it is and how wicked and satanic it is and how much God hates it. Now he's going to judge it. And God said, suffer not a witch to live. Amen? We're going to show you at the end what happens to witches and those that seek power from that other than God, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you what God does to witches in the end that don't repent and sorcerers that don't repent. Amen. Anyway, so this little girl soon finds herself having tea with a fawn. I'll tell you what that is in a little while. In witchcraft and ancient Roman pagan mythology, okay, I guess I'll tell you now. Is it, is it any of the group of ruled deities? A fawn is that which have the bodies of men and the horns, ears, tails, and legs of a goat. The Roman god Faunus, also called the god of nature. And fertility 
was connected to, let's just say, fornication lust. I'll put it that way. I'm trying to be a little bit more, try to be biblical with it and just keep some words out if I can. Here let it be noted in the, the Narnian Chronicle, Prince Caspian, this same strange land, and the little girl finds herself in also populated by gods. We're going to talk about this. Goddesses such as Bacchus, 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 whatever you want to call him, Bacchus, the god of drunken orgies, and the Menades who were frenzied women driven to madness in fornicating cults of Bacchus. I'll put it that way. Now, I'm going to break down who these gods are that are in there, but you have to understand something. There are no absolutes in Narnia. C.S. Lewis in all his writings, there are no absolutes. Why do you think millions of people love him? <laughs> because... His books, I mean, obviously the occult love them because they're introductions to the occult. They're gateways to the occult. They're gateways to understanding magic. They're gateways to spirits and all kinds of other things. That's what they, I mean, if you followed exactly what they said in this book, you could initiate, I mean, you could, you, you would probably get some devils. I mean, if you follow, I mean, it, you probably would. You know, I'm not reading those things because I don't know what they are either because I don't care to read them. But the point is, is that they're there for a reason. Okay, in Narnia, I want to give you some points, and then I'm going to go to these. I'll talk about some of these gods here. In Narnia, as Aslan, or Aslan, whatever his name is, the, is supposed to be a Christ figure, and he negotiates with the white witch. Well, let me ask you a question. Does that sound like a Christ figure? Did Christ negotiate with Satan? No, he rebuked him. Did Christ stand and negotiate with the devil? No. Well, why is this man who's supposed to be this lion, excuse me, that is supposed to be the lion of the tribe of Judah? I don't think he's that lion. You know which lion he is? He's the lion that he's he's the one that is as a lion, as lion, as a lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. That's the lion he is, as lion. That's the one he is. He's the one that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's not a real lion. He's a phony. Just like C.S. Lewis was. Kind of fits that name, doesn't it? wonder how that happened. Little occultic devils. See, they, write, they, they, they know what they're writing in here. They know exactly what they're doing. And most of the time you read it, it all looks like Greek to you. You just look at it like, what in the world are they talking about? I have no idea. It's like reading the Kabbalah. What in the world does that mean? I don't even know what that guy just said or that thing just said. I don't even want to read it because it's, it's, a, bunch of, it's a bunch of satanic nonsense. Makes no sense and stay away from it. Amen. Be careful. There's some things I look at, but understand, I don't go deep into any of these things. The only thing I do is, 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 is read the surface of things. But I have no desire to study these things into deep detail. There's enough surface. I don't even have to dig into any garbage. Amen? There's just surface stuff here. In Narnia, Aslan's father is the author of the deep magic. Are you listening? And the deeper magic. Yet in reality, we know that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He as God never had a beginning. He coexisted with the Heavenly Father. Amen? Jesus wasn't created. Jesus has always been. Yeah. Amen? Jesus has always been. One of Lewis's rhymes in his stories is this. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Parvel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. Okay. Nowhere in Scripture... By the way, he's talking about four thrones. Nowhere in Scripture... If this is supposed to be a, a, a Christian allegory, nowhere in Scripture do we see four thrones mentioned. Never. There are never four thrones mentioned. There's a lot about the fourth kingdom that we hear about. There's a lot, and I'm telling you, this is all spiritual, and that's why. That's why all that starts to make... But listen to me, that's, that's all part of it. But listen, nowhere in Scripture will one find four thrones mentioned. Yet, in tarot card readings, four thrones are found. Well, now, where would he have got that information at? Well, he was a little dirty witch. That's where he got it from. And he was exposing your children to the occult. 
He was trying to initiate them into it. It's exactly what he was doing. And you, by the way. I, I want to ask you a question. A lot of people will say, well, I don't practice witchcraft just because I watch that. Well, the Bible says you're to, you're to avoid all appearance of evil. It also say, by the way, that, that, if I used your argument, not you personally, but people's argument that say that, then I could say that I could watch pornography because I'm not really fornicating. I mean, that's not real fornication. It's not the physical act of fornication. Yeah, but if you've done it in your mind, you're guilty of it already. And you are enter being entertained by devils. And you are entertaining witchcraft. And you are entertaining devils by... You are entertaining them while they are entertaining you. You're making it real comfortable for evil. And, and you've got to ask yourself why. Amen. In Narnia, we hear of deep magic and strange prophecies of sons of Adam, daughters of Eve sitting upon the four thrones. In reality, any tarot card reader will tell you that, that where you will hear about four thrones is in the tarot card readings. In Narnia, the stone table was within it, car within it carved the words of the deep magic. What, what is this deep magic? Why would Aslan, why would he use magic? If he's supposed to be a Christ figure, when did Christ ever use magic? When did Christ ever use magic? And by the way, since when are God's people accustomed to reading in a good favor about magic? i got another one for you. Since when is it okay for them to watch movies that entertain black magic and white magic and all kinds of powers and everything else? Odd. Sorcery was condemned in the scriptures over and over again. Witches and diviners and those that observe times and, and charged objects, cursed objects, and all those things. Yet these things find their ways in our homes and among our stuff and, and in favor. Listen, there, Aslan does not ever put down magic. In fact, there are some that believe in the whole Narnia weird, spooky, cultic world that Aslan actually is the one that governs all the magic in Narnia. Weird. And by the way, this stone table, we'll get to this stone table. In the book Journey into Narnia, author Catherine Linsung notes the stone that is lowest at Stonehenge is called the stone of sacrifice because people suspect that humans were bound and stabbed there in evil ceremonies thousands of years ago. It's almost certain that Stonehenge gave Lewis the idea of the stone table. Well, that would explain a lot. Now, let's talk about this Narnia here. Let's talk about Lucy, the girl that ends up finding herself in Narnia by around some weird light post, whatever that's all about. Anyway, she's in Narnia, right, this girl. And she's, she's in Narnia. And who's the first person that she sees in Narnia? I mean, the first person. Well, it's none other than Pan. <laughs> it's Pan, the pagan fertility fornicating, I'm using nice words, God. Remember him? He flew into Wendy's window in Peter Pan. Remember that? That same pan. Only that pan has been around for a long time, okay? That pan is a wicked deity. It's, I, I'm guessing it's a fallen angel, really. It's a spirit. It's a fallen angel, obviously. Um, now, you might disagree with me, but it doesn't matter. All we know is that it's a false god, and it is written in all kinds of uh, literature and everything else. But what is a pagan, fornicating, perverted god doing meeting with a little girl alone in a street? Well, because, you see, witchcraft... They, yeah, I know. You're saying wow over there, brother, and I know why you're saying wow. Because they are blatantly showing you what witches, high-level Illuminati witches, and all of those people do to pure children. Are you getting my point without me going too deep? Do you get what I... They want to steal the purity of that little child. And they do steal the purity of that little child. And that's why there are child traffickers all over this country and all over this world. And that's what the high-level witches do because when they do that, they get more power. They get more devils into them. They get more into them. 
See, this has scared me. And young people, I hope it does. I hope it scares you enough to cling to this book and believe it's real. I hope it scares you enough that you that you turn that that that, that you resist and you reject any of that stuff. And when somebody tries to tell you, oh, that movie's not that bad, or that that Chronicles of Narnia, or that C.S. Lewis, or those, no, you say that is witchcraft. Because it is. The image of the left pictures, I, I don't have the pictures for you, which you don't need to see them anyway. Uh, the, pagan, the pagan god, the image to the right is the statue of the character Mr. Tumnus in Narnia. Mr. Tumnus is Pan. He has the same horns. He has the same, I mean, he is Pan. He is the god Pan. That's who he is. Plain and simple, that's who he is. Pan is deceitfully renamed Tumnus. Sorry if I don't have my Narnia language down, okay? But uh, Tumnus in the movie. But anyone who is familiar with Satanism and witchcraft can instantly recognize Pan, the evil, perverted god. Despite the declaration of his death, however, Pan is widely worshipped by neo-pagans and Wiccans today. Where he is considered a powerful god and an archetype of male virility. And, yeah, you know. Anyway, uh, Pan is famous for his prowess and is often depicted with, a, with, with the phallic symbol. Okay, He was believed by the Greeks to have piled his charms primarily on maidens and shepherds such as Daphne's. Though he failed with the Syrinx, Pan didn't fail with the Menades. He had every one of them in one... Okay, basically, I'm not going to go into this anymore. I'm not going to read it too descriptively. But basically, he was the god of fertility, okay, and fornication and large groups. Okay, remember when they came off the hill? Remember when, when Moses came down on the hill and he seen them, they were all fornicating? and they were having that big old fornicating party and dancing and everything else, well, that's the same spirit. Remember they put that bowl, they stuck it in there, and out, or stuck that gold in there, and out came that, and they were all bowing down, worshiping. Where did all that stuff come from? Egypt. <laughs> that's where it came from. What were they? Were they spirits and devils in there? Yes, there were. And that's why they were doing that. That's why they were playing the music. They were having those big, huge, wicked, fornicating parties okay does that make sense that, that's the best language i can use without using modern day language that i really don't think is necessary i think you get the point amen all right so so that's what was going on now that's who this god is is pan that's who they put in an image now it doesn't shock me that disney puts that in an image i mean right when you walk out that there's this little girl standing there and this little pervert is holding her hands and, I mean, first of all, what's this, this little girl's doing by herself out in the middle of the street and this pervert's holding her hands? Why? Well, you know why. <laughs> he just told you why, because of the nature of who he is. Lewis describes Tumnus as having reddish skin, curly hair, brown eyes, a short pointed beard, horns on his forehead, cloven hooves, goat legs with glossy brown hair, a strange but pleasant little face. That's nice. A long tail and being only a little taller than Lucy herself. Well, that makes sense because if you ever seen that, if you ever seen Fantasia, you ever seen that before? Come on, quit lying. You know you've seen Fantasia. Knock it off. Fantasia is the one where Mickey has the sorcerer's hat. And he's doing all this music, and it's like a musical. And he's got the sorcerer's head on. He's causing waves, and he's controlling the water, and everything's going crazy. And all these beings are coming out, and all. Remember, remember that? With the, I mean, it's kind of, I think that's what Fantasia is. If I got the right one, I don't know. What's that? Is that part of it? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, you'll see walking along. You'll see these little gods. Actually, you'll see. Actually, that's Bacchus. I'm sorry. You'll see Bacchus in there. That's who's in there. He's in there. Pan is in Peter Pan and obviously some of the others that, uh, I mean, he's everywhere and just about everything perverted. You'll see him show up. Anyway, well, Lewis thought it was a good idea to put, put him in his story. Because, you know, that's real Christian and all, an allegory of Christ. And we're going to put the perverted God, fertility God Pan in there. Yeah, I get it. I get what you're doing now. And he's seen, and he's actually, he's like a good guy at first. But then he ends up seducing her and putting her to sleep with his music. 
Really? You know, there's also, you know, uh, Nate and I were talking about this today. There, there's also in music, there's a, there's a little guy called the Pied Piper that everybody sings about. I'm the Pied Piper. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? You've heard that? Oh, well, who's that? Well, that's your Pied, that's him, that's Pan. That's, that's Pan. They're singing about that spirit. That's right. That's right. That's, that is right. Yes. Well, anyway. Ah, this is, this is actually too easy. Are you getting this? Is this making sense to you? I know I'm filling your wagon here with all this stuff. You're like, is this really going to help? Yeah, it will, especially when you're able to have my C.S. Lewis trilogy on CD. Okay? Hey, man, you can have my C.S. Lewis trilogy, and it'll be free, and it won't be marketed by a bunch of perverts. Such a wicked perverts. He first appears in the story when Lucy arrives in Narnia at the lamppost. He introduces himself to Lucy, and she tells him who, he, who she is. Before inviting her back to his cave for dinner. Yeah, because, I mean, I invite little girls that I don't know back to my cave for dinner. I mean, do we, I, I just wonder, like, what we let our children read and what we let them watch, do we ever think that that's going to impact their decision-making process? I mean, I think it will just a little. Don't you? Yeah, because I want my daughter watching programs where strange guys say, hey, little girl, come back with me. My daughter wouldn't do that, really? Come on, man. I'm just telling you, we really do have rocks in our head. You know what? The Bible's right when it says this. It's right about everything. But when it says this, it, it hits you right over the head. The children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Sad, isn't it? Hmm. Anyway, so uh, Pan brings her back to his place. During dinner, they have a conversation about Narnia before Tumnus starts playing his flute and Lucy falls asleep. When Lucy wakes up, she sees him break down in tears. He confesses that, is he, that he is in the pay of the White Witch who rules Narnia and has made it always winter but never Christmas. It's like Minnesota. It's always winter and never Christmas. Right? Nine months out of the year, it's always winter and never Christmas. I'm going to sit Kirk Cameron after him. That's right. He'll save Christmas. Don't give him any ideas, okay? He'll be jumping into Narnia and trying to save Christmas there. Huh? He'll come here. <laughs> anyway. Who rules Narnia? Okay, anyway, so the White Witch. Okay, and... and Always winter and never Christmas. <laughs> Sounds stupid. She, she had ordered him and the other Narnians to hand over any sons of Adam or daughters of Eve, humans, that he sees in Narnia. Tumnus quickly realizes that he can't bear to give Lucy up to the witch, and so he guides her back to the lamppost to see that she returns safely to her own world. Oh, that's nice. So what do we see now? Now we see that the god Pan, the fertility god, is seen as a nice guy. Do you see how C.S. Lewis was a wicked devil? He never had any absolutes. He took bad, awful, wicked people and made them good. You know who he reminds me of? Like a soap opera. Soap operas do the same thing. They'll take rapists and turn them into heroes of the show. And then you end up cheering for a, for a rapist. Folks, I, I'm telling you, that's the way it is. That's what they do. And that's what he's doing here. He's making you cheer for a pan, the, 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 the false god, the fertility god. It's just, I mean, and, and so this, I mean, just think about it. He takes this girl back to his cave. Anyway. All right, I'm going to move on. Lewis dedicated his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, to Bede Griffiths, the former student of his who became a longtime friend. Griffiths founded a Christian ashram in India. He said that the Hindu temples are a sacrament. And he said no one can say in the proper sense that the Hindu or a Buddhist or the Muslim is an unbeliever. I would say rather that we have to recognize him as our brother in Christ. This was a student of C.S. Lewis that C.S. Lewis dedicated things to. It was like a lifelong friend of his. Well, what did C.S. What did he do? He followed mere Christianity is all he did. The book Mere Christianity, that's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, that, he said, as long as you're sincere, you know, you'll find your way. Right? 
Anyway, I'm not going to read that part. Uh, but by the way, I, I, I'll t cover that on Sunday. That was actually put in here by mistake. Lilith shows up in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Lilith? Well, who's Lilith? Remember what I told you Sunday who Lilith was? Lilith was in the Kabbalah. Lilith is Adam's first wife. Now, Adam didn't have a first wife. The only wife Adam had was Eve, okay? She did, the Bible never says that he had another wife. Never says there was this humanoid race that was around before. Never says that Adam had Lilith for a wife. Where does that come from? That comes from the Kabbalah. So why did C.S. Lewis put a Kabbalah name? Why, why Lilith? Why not, uh, I don't know, uh, Ruth or Sarah or, or Granny or anybody? Why, why, why Lilith? And I know you might think, well, that has to be, that was just an accident. It was, no, that was on purpose. Because he read the books by George MacDonald, which we'll talk about on Sunday. He read the books by George MacDonald, and Lilith is a Kabbalistic uh, symbol and picture. It's a spirit, by the way. Lilith is a spirit. It's an absolute spirit. And, and music artists sing about her, and everything, they all sing about her. He knew what he was doing. Lewis knew exactly what he was doing. I want to give you some points about an allegory. i got to keep moving here, because i got a lot. I hope you understand this. I hope it makes sense. Uh, Lilith shows up in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mr. Beaver tells the children that the White Witch is descended from Lilith. I, mean, I, I can't explain to you right now how wicked that statement was and what he was doing with that, okay? It's just, it's bad. But anyway, uh, who is the first wife of Adam? This could cause confusion, especially for children. Although Mr. Beaver is a fictional character. Is that like Beaver Cleaver? Remember that? No, it's not the same one. It's not the Beave. Um, although Mr. Beaver is a fictional character, he is speaking authoritatively about the real world, the real Adam and Eve of the Bible. You see how C.S. Lewis mixed those two together? He would be like Lilith, Adam, Eve. Sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, Lilith, sons of Adam. What does that do to somebody's mind? Oh, I don't know. Maybe when you get a bit older, you start reading, and somebody tries to get you in the Gnostic writings, which this sick man was into. He was into Gnosticism. He was a wicked witch, and he understood all those books. And, and anyway, so, but what, they throw those terms around, so it gets you thinking, well, why? I mean, C.S. Lewis was a Christian. I mean, he... He talked about Lilith. Lilith, there must be some truth to the Gnostic writings. And Adam, Eve, Lilith. Adam, Eve, Lilith. Do you see what that, do you, that's witchcraft. Do you see that? Do you see how that works? That's, that's witchcraft. Oh, come on, preacher. You're, you're stretching it. No, I'm not. <laughs> he's, he's associating all those things together. So why? Well, come on. I, I hope you don't try to tell me that people aren't confused between the real world. Because I got a lady that's sending me like 15 emails a week that thinks she's a Landon. I mean, I mean, she thinks she's like a cart, right? She's getting ready to ride old Hoss's horse. I'm telling you, man, this lady is weird. And why? Because they can't see through reality. Why? Because of stuff like this. How hard is it for a child to discern between truth and error, truth and error, truth and error? It's impossible. So what does it do? It initiates him. It gets him ready for it. And Satan knows it. And he uses it. It's mind manipulation. It's wicked. And it's no absolutes, and it's wicked and satanic. I'm telling you, this man was a witch. Narnia is not like Pilgrim's Progress, which some people try to say. Well, Pilgrim's Progress, yeah, but number one, Pilgrim's Progress was an allegory. It wasn't witchcraft. It was full of right and wrong. There was the narrow way and the broad way that led to destruction. There was clearly Christ and clearly wickedness and evil and Satan. They had things like giants and other creatures in there, but they were never seen as good. They were seen as demonic and evil. Why? Because, because he was a saved man. John Bunyan was a saved man. He was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't trying to confuse anybody with Pilgrim's Progress. In fact, I'm telling you something right now. I learned a lot listening to Pilgrim's Progress. If you never listened to it, you need to listen to it. Because, I, I mean, I'll tell you something right now. The audio one that Brother Andrew gave me, that I'm telling you what, man, that's the best thing I've ever heard to listen to outside of, you know, Scripture and, and things like that. I mean, Scripture is number one, obviously. It's our, it's our authority. But, but, but that book was one of the most sold books ever next to the Bible. It was in everybody's house. It was on everybody's bookshelf back in the day. Why? Because it was powerful. That's the kind of stuff your kids should read.
Not so, though, in Narnia. What is he teaching? He teaches Kabbalistic teachings. White witchcraft, black witchcraft. But it's all the devil. He's trying to teach, he was trying to teach people that there was good magic and bad magic, and Christ uses magic. Christ uses some of that. How can the people of God accept this man's writing and call him a Christian? Even Douglas Gresham, Lewis's stepson, said recently, churches in Britain and America are promoting the film as a Christian film, but it's not. And the Narnia books aren't Christian novels. However, evangelicals disagree. Listen to this, and listen to who said it. We believe that God will speak the gospel of Jesus Christ through this film, said Lon Allison, director of Illinois' Billy Graham Center. Well, that makes sense. But what was C.S. Lewis doing? Well, I want to use his own letters, his own words, what he said he was doing. A letter C.S. Lewis wrote to one of his many young fans back in 1961. Many young fans. He said this, Supposing there really was a world like Narnia, and supposing Christ wanted to go into that world and save it, as he did ours, what might have happened? The stories are my answer. Since Narnia is a world of talking beasts, I thought he would become a talking beast there as he became a man here. I pictured him becoming a lion there because the lion is supposed to be the king of beasts. Christ called the lion of Judah in the Bible. The whole Narnian story is about Christ. Narnia's lion really is Jesus. Okay. Okay, now I have to take the man at his word. But so far I've showed you where he said Aslan uses magic. Aslan practices magic. So then if Aslan is the Christ-like figure, then he is saying, that, it, or is Christ in his words, C.S. Lewis's own words, then what is he saying? He's saying Christ uses witchcraft. Christ uses magic. But I'm going to tell you that he's not talking about Christ. He's talking about what every single externalization of the hierarchy, every single rotten theos theosophist, every single Luciferian, Mason, Jesuit, black pope, wicked, devil, mystery, iniquity, sorcerer did. He is preparing you for Antichrist. Aslan is Antichrist. That's who he is. Magic was often linked to sunrise or a full moon here. Now I want to talk to you about some of the things that Aslan did. We must go to Aslan. How? Where Aslan was killed. Where there stood a very magical stone before sunrise. I'm reading from their, their text on page 244. Before sunrise they arrived. Caspian saw strange characters in snaky patterns. This is Aslan and the magic here. I would wait for sunrise, your majesty, said Dr. Cornelius. That sometimes has an effect in operations of white magic. Aslan explains the options of these telemarines, these, peop the, the, these people. He says this. He says, will you go back to that island in the world of men from which your fathers first came? The chasm is open for your return but it will close behind you forever. A burly, decent-looking fellow among the telemarine soldiers pushed forward and said, Well, I'll take the offer. It is well chosen, said Aslan, and because you have spoken first, strong magic is upon you. Your future in that world shall be good. Wait a minute. I thought Aslan was the type of, was Christ. I thought it was, he was the Christ that would come to Narnia, and that's what C.S. Lewis was picturing in all his writings. So why would Christ use magic then? Go through it, my son, said Aslan, bending towards him and touching the man's nose with his own. That's weird. It's weird. All who choose to leave Narnia move through the door. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
I mean, this is so easy, it's sickening. It's so easy and out there, straightforward witchcraft. That's why I can't charge for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. Calm down. <laughs> You're still getting charged. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Would you wake up here? I'm going to start screaming if you don't hear something. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm just kidding. All who choose to leave Narnia move through the door in a long line, hand upon the shoulders of the person ahead. The last ones are Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. They glimpse the new home of the telemarines, then find themselves back at the railroad station. Looking again at the mag magician's nephew. Now, listen, these are all the works, okay? These are the books. These are the works. Did anybody ever read that book, The Magician's Nephew? I'm just curious. It's like, I think it's number six in that series or something like that. But uh, at the Magician's F.U., we find some disturbing things. In the creation of Narnia, some very revealing things come. Speaking of the creation of the stars, it says this. One moment, there had been nothing but darkness. Next moment, a thousand, thousand points of light leap out. Have you ever heard that points of light phrase? Where have we heard that points of light phase before? A thousand points of light. George Bush. George Bush Sr., Brother Paul's buddy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Brother Br George Bush Sr. on the floor of the House was giving a speech to Congress, actually the full Congress. He was giving a speech, and what did he say? He says, we're going to have a new world order and a thousand points of light. Well, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from C.S. Lewis. It came before him. What's that? The thousand points of light. I, I, I'm not really... Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I have here, and we'll see if this answers the question. Single stars, constellations, and planets brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds. The phrase, a thousand, thousand points of light, leaps out at us. The fact that Lewis would use this expression is bizarre, the very least, but it points to something much more sinister. Alice Bailey, theosophist, luciferian, and co-founder of the Lucis Trust and Arcane School. In her 1956 book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, you mean like what Lewis was doing? Yeah, pretty much what he was doing. Anyway, uh, tells us exactly what a point of light is. Here's your answer. The men who compromise the occult leadership group known as the New Group of World Servers. These individuals, she remarks, are in the service to the work of the Brotherhood, the forces of light. They are the ones who are to usher all of mankind from the darkness of outmoded Christianity and faded nationalism into the bright and shining New World Order. Does it, you know who Alice Bailey is? You know who Alice Bailey is. Some of you do, anyway. If you don't, that's okay, too. You don't really want to know her. You, you'll hear of her because she was responsibility for the externalization of the hierarchy, pretty much, I mean, in her, in her own writings here. In her book, Discipleship in a New Age, Bailey tells her occult followers to repeat, I am a point of light within the greater light. I am a spark of sacrificial fire, the spark. <clears throat> Focus within the fiery will of the sun god. What these servants of Satan are attempting to do by blending their points of light is to usher in the new world order, the age of Aquarius. You heard that song before, haven't you? The age of Aquarius? I'm not singing it for you. But you've heard it before, haven't you? You know it. Do you, I just wish that you would understand. These people all hate Christ. But we marvel, and the Bible says this, marvel not, don't marvel, no marvel that Satan comes, and his ministers come the same way. We've been infiltrated. And it's time to get rid of the accursed things. It's time to get them out of your house. It's time to tell your friends. It's time to warn people. Amen? Now, I want to move on to something else here. The Magic Rings of, of Andrew Ketterly. We're a small collection. That's a, that's a, has anybody, does anybody know who that Andrew Ketterly is? He was in the, in the, uh, in the Lion, the, or one of the, one of the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, one of the books anyway. Anyway, that's how this little girl ends up transporting herself 
are these rings. The magic rings of Andrew, Andrew Ketterly were, were a small collection of yellow and green finger rings which had, he had created to respectfully transport people to and from the wood between the worlds. The wood between the worlds was the name given to a mysterious realm of portals that allowed magical travel between the worlds of Sharn, Earth, and Narnia, among numerous others. Now, you do understand that people have read those books. Have you read, who's read, I mean, well, you don't tell me, but some of you have read Chronicles of Narnia, right? So you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have watched the movies. You, you know what's being addressed here. You kind of understand it. Some of you haven't. Good. Don't. Okay? Don't. And tell others not to. And inform others. Because you know, I'd hate to be it for you to say, well, I don't need this because I don't watch that. And then somebody comes along in your world, you got a cousin, a niece, a nephew, and they're, they're reading that garbage and you don't say nothing to them. You just keep silent and you don't give them any information. You, did you know that everything that God gives you is not always about you? Sometimes we think, well, pff, I don't need that. Well, yeah, you do, number one. <laughs> number two, you, you need to help somebody else with it. Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, somebody in your family right now has those books. Anybody want to raise their hand and say they think somebody in their family has those books right now? Anybody? I'm just curious. Anybody at all want to be honest? See how this applies? Somebody in your family or somebody you know has those books, have watched those movies, are tied into that stuff, and they're searching into that stuff, and the devil's going to use that. Now, we can either warn them, and we can learn, and we can warn it. And listen, I don't like doing this. I like rip-roaring about other things. Believe me, this is all fact stuff for me. I don't even like doing this, to be honest with you. I, I, I really don't like it. I'd rather not do it. But when I see a bunch of Baptists defending C.S. Lewis, when I see a bunch of Christians defending C.S. Lewis, matter of fact, when I see that some of you have read those books and watched those movies, it's necessary. It had the form of a quiet forest... This is the wood between the worlds here. Dotted with many wide pools of supposed water, each of which served as a portal to a different world. Now, it's beyond me why Christians, if they read that, would be like, not be like, um, there's a bell going off here. I mean, we're not supposed to be like going through portals to different worlds. I mean, Christians don't do that stuff. And with magic rings, I mean, I don't know. There's just, I mean, was there like a, I mean, is there a duh moment for anybody here? I'm just, I'm just wondering why there's not, like, what happened to the duh moment here? Like, I, I, I can't understand this. Isn't there like a duh moment here where it's like, um, duh? I mean, like, I mean, the guys, the dude's talking about magic rings and putting them on and going to different worlds and stuff. I mean, that's just, that's, I don't think that's biblical. You know what the problem is? What's that, brother? That's right. And you know, you know what else the problem is? is most people don't believe it's real. The yeah, the Bible's boring. Well, come out to the streets with that Bible. It won't be boring. Hey. Go out there and see what happens in the real world. Come back and be like, I can't make that stuff up, man. That stuff happens every week out there. You want, you'll see devils and witches and warlocks and wickedness and vileness and disgustingness, and it's real. Instead, they glamorize witchcraft. That's all this is, is a glamorization of evil. And the devil's a master of it. Because if he came to you with horns and a pitchfork, looking like hell worn over, what would you say? You'd run! But he doesn't come that way, does he? What does he come like? An angel of light, a beautiful creature. And that's how he packages witchcraft. Beautiful, you need this. It's the beauty of light, and you can have light. That's right. Exactly. It tells you that book is there. just, oh, you mean just like C.S. Lewis did? Yeah, C.S. Lewis told you Jesus was wrong. Oh, but let me go run out and buy his books and put them in my Christian school. Let me go real fast. Let's do that. God forbid that we should actually research some things and know something first. Who hath bewitched you? I know it's hard to take. I know I don't like it either. I hate being wrong about stuff. Amen, I hate being wrong. The rings are two types. Yellow rings transport a person from a free world or from a world to the wood. If a person on earth touches a yellow ring, for example, they will disappear and appear in a pool that leads to the earth in the wood. The green rings transport a person out of the wood to a world. If a person in the wood wants to go to Sharn, for example, they step into the pool that leads to Sharn while touching a green ring and then materialize there. 
Okay, so um, these rings, right, that they had in Narnia. You ever heard of the Lord of the Rings? Heard of that, right? J.R. Tolkien. Okay. Um, these rings uh, are real in witchcraft. Do you understand that? They are, they are enchanted jewelry. And they use them for different powers. And they have been used regularly throughout history through different religions uh, or through different pagan uh, groups. Uh, they've been used. And they actually... They actually are very popular among witches and warlocks and sorcerers and everything else. And they actually sell them. I mean, you can buy a ring. You can buy these rings that have different devils in them that do different things. Um, by the way, Manly P. Hall, 33rd degree Mason, he informs us of the occult meaning of the Pythagorean signet ring in his classic textbook, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Albert Pike, former sovereign grand commander of the, of the Scottish Rite Masons, wrote in Morals and Dogma that the pentagram, pentacle, Kabbalistic star on this ring carries with it the power of commanding the spirits. Use it, he instructed, to bind the demons of the air, the spirits of fire, the scepters of water, and the ghosts of the earth. Note that the star atop the ring is encircled by the Ouroboros serpent. Now, I'm not going to go into a bunch of things. Oh, by the way, in Lord of the Rings, he says this, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Yeah, that's a bad word in that case. But I'll bind you, yeah, Pentecostals, charismatics to abuse that. Yep, yep. So anyway, you could track what 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 now what was a guy like Manly P. Hall and Albert Pike, who has a statue and he's lifted up in Washington, DC as this great figure. What would that Satanistic guy that tells you to take a ring and you can bind devils with it and have all this power? And he's in the why would he be doing in Washington, DC? Well, that's a no-brainer. Um, all the devils are in Washington, DC, aren't they? Um, amen. Uh, you caught that, didn't you? <clears throat> amen. All right, anyway, so these rings here. So why is C.S. Lewis using charged enchanted objects for stories about Jesus Christ in a positive way? The rings themselves were created from a magical dust. Listen to this. Listen to what they explain these rings are from. These rings themselves were created from magical dust originally in the possession of Uncle Andrew's godmother. This powder had come via the lost island of Atlantis <laughs> from the wood itself. Thus, originally, the dust must have been used in traveling between worlds, and it is implied that in the past, travel from our world to others, such as Sharn, may have been more common. This offers an explanation of how in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Jadis, the White Witch, is described by the beavers, as, yeah, by the beavers, as descending from Adam's first wife, Lilith. Oh, Do you understand what they're saying? Well, basically, there's a dark, wicked magic called Atlantean magic. That's what he was teaching. Why would this guy teach you about a place called Atlantis? Because that's what esoteric occultic people do. That's not what Christians do. That's not what they do at all. <clears throat> David Cloud said this about the Chronicles of Narnia series, which had a great influence on evangelicalism as a whole because of its popularity with children. Lewis taught that those who sincerely serve the devil, called Tash, are actually serving Christ, Aslan, and will eventually be accepted by God. Consider the last chapter further up and further in. In chapter 15 of the book, he says this, Then I fell at his feet and thought, Surely this is the hour of death for the lion who is worthy of all honor will know that I have served Tash all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it is better to see the lion and die than to be tis rock of the world and live and not have seen him. But the, glorious bent, the, but the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue, that's weird, and said, Son, thou art welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but the servant of Tash. He answered, Child, all the service that thou hast done to Tash, I account as service done to me. 
Then by reason of my great desire for wisdom and understanding, I overcame my fear and questioned the glorious one and said, Lord, is it then true as the ape said that thou and Tash are one? Uh. <laughs> the lion growled <laughs> so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me and said it is false, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. Uh-oh. What did he just teach? Did you catch it? Ah, you didn't catch it, did you? He said that he is showing you and saying that God and Satan are opposites. No, they're not. No, they're not. God created Lucifer. Lucifer fell. But God is the father of all living. God is the power. I mean that by creator. Not in a covenant relationship until you've been born against the blood of Jesus Christ. But God is above all. He has no equal. He has no opposite. No. What is he teaching? Sons of God, daughters of men, yin and yang, Eastern mysticism, occultism, esoteric teaching about God. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing here. Not because he and I are one, because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him. For I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is, no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Boy, if that ain't witchcraft, I don't know what is. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath, for the oath's sake, it is by me that he has truly sworn, though he know it not, and it is I who reward him. And if any man do cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash whom he serves, and by Tash his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand, child? Do you understand they're initiating your little kid into the occult? Do you understand that little kid? There's a wideness to God's mercy. I'm not doing my Billy Graham impression for you. I'm not doing that tonight. Stand away from that. Does thou understand, child? I said, Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me. Yet I have been seeking Tash all my days. Beloved, said the glorious one, unless thy desire had been for me, thou shouldest not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. Okay, so what did they just teach your kid? They tried to teach your kid that, you know, if you serve Satan, but you're truthful and you keep your oath to him, well, then you'll end up to God anyway. That's, that's what he just said. He just said that. That's what he just taught. Next, in page 154 of the book, one saw sticky and stained fingers everywhere. Now, this is where these false gods come in, Bacchus and Menades and all these others. Listen to this. One saw sticky and stained fingers everywhere, and though mouths were full of laughter, never ceased, nor the yodeling cries, till all of a sudden everyone felt at the same moment that the game, whatever it was, and the feast ought to be over, and everyone flopped down breathless on the ground and turned his face to Aslan to hear what he would say next. At that moment, the sun was just rising, and Lucy remembered something and whispered to Susan, I say, Sue, I know who they are. Who? The boy with the wild face is Bacchus. I mean, Bacchus is the god of wine and revelry. Drunkenness and wickedness, do you understand? So then, I know who they are. That's Bacchus, and the old one on the donkey is Salinas. Don't you remember Mr. Tumnus telling us about them? Don't you remember Pan told us about him a long time ago? <laughs> him and his buddies, Pan and his buddies. He told us about his friends. Yes, of course, but I said, Lou, what? Listen to this. This is how wicked this guy is. I wouldn't have felt very safe with Bacchus and all his wild girls if we'd met them without Aslan. I'm not making it up. It's right there. I'm almost done, actually, okay? Bear with me. I'm almost done. I should think not, said Lucy. I don't feel safe with Bacchus either. Yeah, you shouldn't feel safe with devils. But they're laughing and partying with him. And Aslan, supposed to be the Christ figure, is standing around while they're laughing and partying with the god of wine. I mean, I don't know. 
Maybe I just look at things too simplistic. Is that what it is? Do I? What's that? Yeah, they're really serving him if you serve Bacchus. You're, that means, Brother Paul, that means if you want to be a sloppy old drunk, if I want to be a sloppy old drunk, if I want to live, live for the devil, it's God just counts it as service to him. Aslan does. Yeah, Aslan. Sorry. Aslan. Page 205 of Prince Caspian. Then three or four of the red dwarfs, that's weird, came forward with their tinder boxes and set light to the pile, which first crackled and then blazed and finally roared as a woodland bonfire on midsummer night ought to do. Okay. Anybody want to wonder what they were doing up there at that grove up there? During the, yeah, no, I don't really want to wonder that much, but with fire and everything else up there, what they were doing this couple days ago, last Friday. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's what the fires are about here. But listen to this. I want, this is from the book. I want you to listen to this now, okay? And, f okay, he says here that which first crackled and then blazed and finally roared as a woodland bonfire on midsummer nights ought to do. And everyone sat down in a wide circle around it. Okay, then Bacchus, Salinas, and Manades, Manades, I don't know what they call that guy, Manades or something, began a dance, listen, far wilder than the dance of the trees. How do trees dance? Not merely a dance for fun and beauty, though it was that too, but a magic dance of plenty. And where their hands touched and where their feet fell, the feast came into existence. They're saying food magically appeared while they were doing that. Because they were, what were they doing? They were, they were conjuring up all this stuff. It's just garbage. I know it's just garbage, I know. Yeah. I, I, well, people read it all the time. All the time. But a magic dance of plenty... And there were hands touched while their feet fell. The feast came into existence, sides of roasted meat that filled the grove with delicious the grove with delicious smell, and wheaten and cakes and oaten and cakes, honey and man colored. Anyway, basically, that's what they were doing, okay? In Greek mythology, who are these people? In Greek mythology, Menades were the female followers of Dionysus, Bacchus, and the Roman in the Roman pantheon, and most significant members of the god Retina. Their name literally translates as raving ones. Often the Menades were portrayed as inspired by Dionysus into a state of ecstatic frenzy through a combination of dancing and intoxication. That's what they were conjuring up. That's what he's showing you, okay? That's what he's showing children. That's, I mean, he's, he, it's, it's like plain as day. He's showing them that. During these rites, the Menades would dress in fawn skins and carry a, thirs a thyrsus, a long stick wrapped in an ivy and vine leaves and, tri and tripped with a pine cone. They would weave ivy wreaths around their heads or wear a bull helmet in honor of their god and often hand handle or wear snakes. We're almost done here, actually. Dionysus is the god of the grape harvest. Now, these all made their appearance in this in a, in a positive light. Understand this. That's why I'm even mentioning it. They all made their appearance in a positive light. Dionysus is the god of the grape harvest, winemaking, wine of ritual madness, fertility, theater, and religious ecstasy in Greek mythology. His name thought to be Theonom in linear B tablets. Anyway, I don't read that. Um, anyway, Dionysus, Bacchus, same guy. Okay. His origins are uncertain, and his cults took many forms. Some are described by ancient sources as Thracian, others as Greek, and some cults he arise from the east. And as Asiatic foreigner and other ones, anyway, so basically that's who he is, Greek mythology. He's a false god. Selenius was the old rustic god of the dance of wine press, his name being derived from the words to, to move to and fro, the wine trough. He, also, he was also the god of drunkenness who rode in the train of Dionysus seated on the back of a donkey. The old satyr was the foster father of the god Dionysus. The divine child that delivered into his care after the birth from the thigh of Zeus and raised to Silenius. Anyway, so Silenius was a follower of Bacchus. Susie, Susan and Lucy meet him when they are dancing with the walking trees. So they're dancing with these perverted gods. 
At the same time, they're meeting Bacchus and Selenius, Peter, Edmund, Trumpkin, are meeting Prince Caspian. Anyway, Selenius has an amazing power as he calls out for refreshments. Grapes grow all over the place. Well, it makes sense if you understand that he was the god of that. That's who they portrayed him as. He was mentioned in the end of the book when Narnia was free again. Okay, so anyway, so these old perverted gods are in there. Turn to Revelation chapter 9, verse number 21. If that ain't enough witchcraft, there's, there's all sorts of circle making going on. There's all sorts of other things in there. But I think you got the point, right? I think, it's a, I think you get the point of it. And by the way, Brother Paul, when you said that it didn't make it, like, how does anybody read this? It doesn't, make any, it doesn't make any sense, does it? You know why it doesn't make any sense to you? Because you don't have that spirit. See, they have a false spirit inside of them. And, and, and they have a spirit of Antichrist inside of them. So they understand it and it all makes sense. All those symbols are riddles to us. Most of that stuff is like a riddle. It's like, who, this is just stupid. How does anybody, how can you, and you can't really concentrate on it or understand it because it doesn't make any sense to you. It's just like when a witch reads the Bible, they get nothing out of it. Why? Well, except condemnation. That's what they get out of it. When people tell you all I get from the Bible is condemnation, it's because they're lost. And that's all God wants them to have is condemnation. Do you understand that? Because the law is our schoolmaster bring us to Christ. The law condemns them. You and I get nothing out of this. It's like a bunch of riddles. It's a bunch of nonsense and riddles. But I assure you that it's not. It means something to them. To us, it's nonsense and it matters nothing. But let me show you what happens and what God does with those that practice witchcraft. Revelation chapter 9, verse number 21. Listen, this sorcery is going to be so strong in this earth. I want you to understand this. They're showing you the externalization of the hierarchy, the coming of the Antichrist kingdom, that fourth kingdom, the Antichrist, his power, all of those things in different things. They show us in music, right? You've seen it in music. I showed you that. In rock music, in rap music, I showed you the devilish spirit and the wickedness and the spirit of Antichrist, right? Uh, I show, we showed you that in the sons of God, the daughters of men, in the occult, in the Masons, and all these other groups. They are all preparing for the Antichrist. The Mormons, all of them. Go back and see the sermon that I did about the compartmentalization of, of, of Satan's kingdom, how it's all compartmentalized, but they all have the same goal to raise Antichrist, to bring him up, bring the baby up. They want to bring him up. Okay, they're waiting to bring him up. All right, that's their goal. But understand this. This C.S. Lewis with science fiction is another way to bring on the Antichrist. It's another way. And listen how important this is. Revelation 9.21, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They wouldn't repent of their sorcery. Why? Because I'm telling you, in this end time, sorcery is going to be so strong and powerful. It includes drug addictions. It includes uh, magic. It includes all of those things, charged objects, enchanted things, witchcrafts. All, it includes all of those things. And they're not going to repent of it because strong delusion will be given to them. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What does he say there? Sorcerers. Why does he keep talking about sorcery? Oh, I don't know, because most Baptists don't believe it's real. It's not really. There's no real sorcery today. There's no real witchcraft today. These guys were just playing games. They were just kidding. That's all. It wasn't really that serious. You watched it on television and glorying after it and glamorizing it and loving it and seeking that power and wickedness and watching those things and being entertained by those things. No, that's not real. Why did God say that the sorcerers, I mean, he's pretty serious about this in Revelation, isn't he? He said, they're going to burn in the lake of fire. Revelation 22, verse number 15, he says this, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. How about that? How about for without our dogs and sorcerers? Why? Because sorcery is going to be at an all-time high. That's why when that fourth kingdom comes, when it comes through, and that Antichrist reign comes up and the power that we are seeing, and that's why they have been preparing for it. That's why all of these... And you, you heard what Alice Bailey said, the thousand points of light, the externalization of the hierarchy, all of that. She's telling you this new world order is coming, and it is purely Luciferian. I do believe that Luciferianism it will be the end-time religion. I do believe that. 
Luciferianism will be that end time. I believe Rome is going to, Brother Beller said this too, and, and, and Brother Nate said this in his studies, and I believe it to be true, that I believe they are going to morph Roman Catholicism into complete Luciferianism. They already have it all set up. The Saturnelli hats, the the, the you know the 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 Lucifer's throne in the in in the Vatican. <gasps> what? I know where Satan's seat is. Yeah, so do I. It's in Rome. That's exactly where it's at. Sitting right there. He's waiting for him. Here you go. Here's your seat. They're just waiting for him. <gasps> this Bible's true. It surely is. Yeah. Okay, this is what Jesus said, though. He said, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murders and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I mean, preacher, we're supposed to testify of sorceries and wickedness and, to, and warn people of that? Yeah, I know. You didn't think so, huh? Yeah, you are. Jesus said, I, I send, I'm sending you. I'm sending my message. I'm sending this to you to, to, to warn them, to inform them of what's coming. See, it'd be real easy never to touch any of these things. But the problem is, is that most of your family is consumed with it. Most of your friends are consumed with them. Most lost people out there take their theology from guys like C.S. Lewis and postmodernism, and that's what they believe. How many times have you heard high-level people, Obama, all these other people, and how many times have these people said, well, we all, and George Bush, George Bush Jr., well, we all serve the same God. It's the same God. George, but it's the same God. He got up there and said that. Remember that when he got up there and said that? It's all the same God. I don't know what you guys are getting so excited for. It's all the same God, and he's right. The one he serves is because he serves the God of this world. So when he talks to the Muslims, he says, it's all the same God. You're right, it is. Your God is the God of this world. Folks, it's the showdown. It's coming, and C.S. Lewis is a part of it. He was a part of it preparing people. And people are so bewitched by that man. They are so bewitched by those writings. They are so bewitched by it all that they won't, a lot of them won't even listen to the truth. I had one guy come on my Facebook page the other day and he, and he said, I'm, I said, he said, C.S. Lewis was a good Christian. He quoted some verses that he said about Jesus, some favorable things that he said about Jesus. And I said, I think you should listen to this sermon. He goes, well, I'm not gonna because I know he was a good man. Okay, bye. Get out of here. Beat it. Why, why don't you want to know if that man said something? Because he's bewitched. That's why. Father, thank you, Lord, for your words. And Lord, uh, we know that there's a judgment coming upon witchcraft and sorcery. Dear God, many professing Christians today in churches all over are messing around with C.S. Lewis's stuff. I've heard about it. In fact, a lady came and visited this church, dear God. You know that. And she came here for that reason because she said that her church was practicing those things and, and reading those books and movies. And dear God, I pray that your people would be delivered. I pray that this would wake some up. I pray that, Lord, we could help some folks to be free from that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.